Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dee Dee Wilsey, President of the Board of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. She has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Dee Dee, for joining us today. Thank you for asking me. So you have led this institution through very dramatic changes. Let's talk about your initial involvement with the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Originally, I was doing the capital campaign for Grace Cathedral, and someone came to me and said, would you do the campaign to rebuild the Young Museum? And I thought, huh, Young Museum, art, buildings, fundraising, fun, everything I love. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And you had done several other campaigns I'd previously. I'd done a campaign, capital campaign for a Catholic girls' school in the Mission District called Immaculate Conception Academy. So that was my first campaign. And then Grace Cathedral, which really took a long time, yes. was my second one, and then the de Young. So the first really important thing was to decide whether they were going to tear down the building and build a new one or not. And that was a big mess of a vote. And the de Young has actually had a history of being damaged through seismic events. Absolutely. Um, and it, 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 it had been uh, very badly damaged. Mm -hmm. It had been, um, it had to be reconstructed, I think, in 1903. Right. It was built. Uh, you know, in the eight, late 1800s, it was for 30 years the San Francisco Memorial Museum. It was not called the de Young. Right. It didn't become the de Young until 1924, when Mr. de Young was actually built the tower. Mm -hmm. And for that gift, they named it de Young, and he died in 27. But it was a big fight whether to tear it down or not, a big fight whether to leave it in the park, and we did a bond issue in 96, city bond issue. I was somewhat surprised when we didn't win it, but I understood the political structure and I understood just before who the factions were against us and that we weren't going to win. You have a museum that is, um, that has some real issues. You have a bond issue that has gone down in flames and you can't really do anything with, a, with what is seen as a historic building, but you can't really touch it. You don't have any money and you mm -hmm. can't get insurances because you can't you have size, yeah. seismic damage, so you can't bring in great works because people won't loan great works mm -hmm. to an institution with insurance issues. What do you do then? It's just the kind of thing I love, <laughs> a really horrible mess. Um, actually, when we lost, I was glad. I wasn't glad because you know, it wasn't what I wanted. Did you, take, did you take lemons and you turn them into lemonade? No, I thought it was great because then I had something to do for the next two years <laughs> because then we decided we'd do another bond issue. But I had to figure out this city business because, you know, there, we have no home rule, we have nothing. And we lost by just the tiniest This is the bit, second time. Second time in June. So now you've lost twice. Now we've lost twice. I suddenly realized what a great opportunity this was. Because up until now, we were talking about the city, city money. We had to raise $35 million. The rest was city, how small the museum would be. Every speech, I said, no great architect will be engaged here. It will be so user-friendly. It will wag its tail when you walk by. So it was beginning to line up that it would have been a compromise. Totally compromised. On all 250,000 square feet. The next morning, I went down to our offices, which were on Post Street and you've never seen sadder people in your life. And I said, it's fine, it's fine. I left the office, I called Willie Brown, I said, I wanna come and see you. I went to see him, I said, listen, I'm gonna do this myself, don't worry about it, I might need your help. But I was so excited, because I thought, this is fabulous. This is gonna be fun, we're gonna do it the way we want, we're gonna hire architects, we're gonna, I mean, this is gonna be the greatest thing that ever happened to the city. You provided the impetus, the drive. Mm -hmm. Harry provided the project management. You had players in the city, whether it was city attorneys or, or others, playing their part. Your staff played their part. You brought in architects. You had your board members, your donors, your contributors, who all added their element to this until you ended up with a privately funded mm -hmm. museum that is a magnificent structure uh, to completely replace this seismically challenged, uh, knit together mm -hmm. uh, structure that, that was perennially uh, in, in danger of being damaged. People really embraced the idea. And I said, look, we have to do something of the art. What did you think we were going to do? Store it over at the Legion? So 
they embrace the idea of a new museum. And then fast forward, you have the opening, which which uh, Harry uh, planned with, with the exhibition schedule that he had uh, developed. And at that point, when he decides that he wants to retire, you and the board are now faced with who is your next person. But I knew who my new director was going to be at that point. We actually appointed him in October. And so we hired John. Uh, his start date was um, February 1st, I think, of 2006. And then we went out wildly lining up shows. And John Buchanan, Harry Parker's successor, was a totally different personality. Describe John's gifts from your perspective as the president of the board. John was the exact opposite of Harry. Harry was from the East Coast, old school, um, Harvard, worked at the Met, marvelous, marvelous man. John was what I would have called a whippersnapper. He energetic. was from the South. He had a wonderful drawl. He was energetic. He'd come, he'd call me every single day. Hi, he'd say, hi, how are you? What you doing? What you doing? <laughs> and he was fabulous, but he was so different. He was just a, a guy who would get in and do whatever was necessary. He was absolutely the right choice. He was enthusiastic. He could sell anything to anybody. He knew people all over the world. When you travel with him, you realize he really had a marvelous knowledge of art, which did not come across when you first met him. But I have traveled with him many, many, many places, and his knowledge of art was unbelievable. We were in the Louvre one time, one of our early trips. We went to one gallery, and he said, they just moved that picture. And he went to the guard, and he said, did they not just move that picture? And the guard said, yes, you're right. It used to be there, but it was cleaned, and they moved over. They said, I thought so. I thought, he was amazing. He could tell you the crowned heads of Europe for the past 300 years and every cousin and nephew they had. He also Amazing man. had a very, very fine uh, sense of how to create a portfolio of exhibitions that mm -hmm. could cover a very broad front, attract people of all different backgrounds and interests and, and passions uh, into the institution. And together, um, uh, John, his staff, the board, uh, really drove an enormous boost in attendance from a museum oh, yes. that had been, been closed. Mm -hmm. Not only did that, did that attendance um, go up in the first year, but it seemed to keep going. A lot of it was luck and being in the right place at the right time. It, it, it's, it was so interesting watching how John and his team would shift and move exhibitions and with reference to what was going on at the other, ex at the other uh, museums and the other, um, the other arts organizations. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really being a good, good, that's good museum programming, you know, and we do it, we look at, like we just looked at exhibitions. We're now booked up through 2015, but we just did a Nureyev show and we did it in conjunction with the ballet. And I said, this is a great opportunity to bring in another organization. You want to bring in your other organizations. While MoMA's closed, we're gonna do a small show with them because we wanted to do something with MoMA, because it's just being a good neighbor. And that's, that's good mu museum policy, but it's really good for the community. And we have two museums, so it's always intentional that if we have, um, well, Vermeer now, these are actually the two closest shows where we've got Louvre and Vermeer. We tend to have an American thing mm -hmm. in one place and European at the other. So you always have something for everybody. We're gonna have Hockney, in September, right. and we're gonna have Bulgari upstairs, and we're going to still have um, European over at the Legion, but you really want to be able to say, if you don't like that, go to the other museum. It's completely different. I mean, that's the beauty of those two museums. You always have something that's different, and you program it accordingly. You also use your assets to engender goodwill, mm -hmm. and to engender the kind of obligation that would lead somebody to to loan you their works as, as the museum loans, mm -hmm. um, loans its work, as your board members, mm -hmm. your, yourself, mm -hmm. other board members, um, loan their works mm -hmm. out. We have, um, right now, John Friedi's collection mm -hmm. was a board member. We have, um, we had a collection from Denise Fitch over at the Legion. Right. We have a glass collection, which is from George Sachs on loan. 
we have um, one other collection from a trustee. I've forgotten which one. We often do that. That's one of the things you look at when you're looking at trustees. Do they have a collection? Do they have something you can borrow? And you barter it kind of by sending it to another museum. That's, that's how you curry favor because you don't have great collections in most museums. We do it. Every museum does it because then you can call on the other museum. Right. John particularly liked to loan to Portland because it was his previous museum and also to the Dixon because he could say, look at what I've got to work with. And there are some very generous people in San Francisco who have some very lovely collections and they have been wonderful to our museums. MoMA has a giant number of donors who, who loan not just the Fishers but others who loan to MoMA on a regular basis. That's part of that collection. And um, the National Gallery, we're about to get a Meyerhoff collection, and Mr. Meyerhoff is loaning some of his personal collection to the collection at the National Gallery, which is then coming to us in January. And it, that's what you do. I mean, but it was nice of Rusty Powell to call him and say, could you give us some of your personal collection as well? That's museum speak. As a public institution, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco serve a whole range of different constituencies from uh, uh, public school children uh, to uh, in inner city adults mm -hmm. uh, to people living in the suburbs, visitors. Mm -hmm. This is one of the Huge. premier tourist destinations right. in the world. Uh, talk about how you shape the programs of the fine arts museums or your staff shapes mm -hmm. the programs of the fine arts museums and what is the role of a board in, in that a aspect? Because it's not governance per se, uh, but the board has a responsibility to the city of San Francisco mm -hmm. and to the people who live here. So how do you, if you're not, if, if you're not directly managing, how do you express that responsibility and how does that end up resonating through the programs of the, of the museum? Well, I think it, probably the strongest way is that we, as you know, we have many committees on the board and each, I mean, they're all chaired by mostly these young trustees, they all have children, young children. So the education department is enormously popular with the trustees because they all want to be involved. They support all the education programs. We have enormous uh, education programs. And um, they drive that. Now they are redoing our IT system because we have a lot of tech trustees. And they want to do the website. And they are constantly calling me saying, have you noticed how outdated this is? And I just say, yes, 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 fix it, fix it, whatever you want to do. They are donating the money for this because this is dear to them. I'm thrilled about it. Um, they're very, very involved in really every aspect of the museum right now. So they're funding, they're, they're volunteering, they're volunteering their time, mm -hmm. they're, um, they're They're using their companies to volunteer and donating um, from equipment to whatever. They're really... 100% behind all of us, and they're and driving the, it. And then ideas as well, because mm -hmm. a museum cannot afford to necessarily maintain themselves on the cutting edge oh, not of a all. discipline that isn't mm -mm. core to them. So technology moves so oh, rapidly. Oh, it's unbelievable. And they're also interviewing some of the, the new people who've been hired for this, because they actually do that in their own companies. Right. And so a couple of the staff people came and said, look, we don't have any idea whether these are good people we're hiring, because we don't know anything about this. Would you mind if we ask some of the trustees in on these interviews so that they could really tell us if they're qualified or not. So they chose who they wanted because they know who they are. And they have been in, on the hiring of the really tech people, high tech. I've also noticed over the years that your board has significantly changed. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, become a much younger board, much younger. a more diverse board in terms of of interests and um, experiences mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, I know you feel that you still have a way to go, and, and boards constantly evolve, but, but talk about how that has been engendered, because you don't want to lose your old cons older constituents, people who have invested their time mm -hmm. and effort and their treasure, uh, but you also need to constantly refresh. Well, the best thing is we have term limits. So we have three three-year terms, nine years, and then you go off the board. And I think that's very healthy. It's the way it is in most other organizations. Well, some. But, well, all the ones I'm involved in, pretty much. But they 
Um, but then we got all these young trustees. And I watched as some of the terms were expiring and they were 42 years old, something like that. And I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to lose them. And we've invested a lot of time and effort in these people. Plus, I want some of them to be president. And I don't want to lose them. We also had great expertise of some of the older trustees, like, if I could use a name, Louise Rennie, right. city attorney, Belva Davis, very valuable, very active trustees. I didn't want to lose them either. So I went to the nominating committee and said, can you propose something? And they decided to change the bylaws so that it would say, if the loss of the person was a detriment to the board, they could go off for a year and be reelected for one more term. So Belva was reelected, Louise Rennie was reelected, and a couple of other people, but it is anything but automatic. So I think in, um, forgotten how many years that's been, like four years or something, I think they've reelected seven out of maybe 15, 16 people who've gone off. Um, the age of the people reelected, the oldest one is 90, so he'll be 99 when his term is up, but he is the person who has spearheaded the renovation of the Salon Doré over at the Legion of Honor, oh. raised all the money, really completely spearheaded that operation. And uh, I don't know how the, oh, young the youngest is, maybe 40 or something. So it's quite a diverse group, but it's a good idea because, you know, you invest so much, you get these people so enthusiastic. They really love the museum. We have no minimum uh, financial requirement to be on the board. And that, I think, is very important. Diversity is one of the requirements of board membership. So. We really are very careful about diversity. Also, you need to have a certain, 60% have to live in the city of San Francisco. And we get young members because there is no financial requirement. Some of the boards in town are very expensive to participate in. And I'm very proud of the fact that they don't, I'd like them to give a dollar a year because when you go to a foundation, you need to say you have 100% participation. But if they can't afford it, I say to them, just pay your children's tuition. That's the most important thing. And remember us if you ever can. But we get young people by doing that. And we do have diversity. And I think it makes any board much more interesting. Nothing worse than a cookie cutter board. When we closed the museum, the most frequent visitor was a 60-year-old Caucasian woman. Now the most frequent visitors are a young Hispanic family. And that was true right after we opened, reopened. Uh, part of it is because of Friday night at the De Young which is a tremendously successful program. We have people who take care of children for single parents. We have programs for everybody. We have music, we have food, we have drink. The galleries are open. Um, and it tends to be key to whatever the particular program is. Um, when we had the post-impressionists, they had a guy painting like Van Gogh. He had his ear in his pocket. And it was very, <laughs> very entertaining. We, we, when we did the Nureyev show that Friday night, I emceed it because I'm on the board of the valet, and we had Helgi Tomlinson, he was there. Yes. And we showed Red Shoes, the movie downstairs in Corette. And uh, we gave, the little girls all had pink tutus, and it was really a wonderful thing. And we had two dancers from the ballet who performed it, in her, not intermission, but the, one of their programs was this dance. They did two different things. So we tied in with the community, and it's really a happening. And when I moved to San Francisco, Wednesday night at the Marina Safeway was the pickup place, and now it's <laughs> Friday night at the De Young. So I'm very proud of that. It's so interesting to watch the strategy come together with the visceral sense of what people enjoy, the the social sense of what connects people, the uh, savviness of of what people invest in, uh, the uh, sensibility of of how do you bring, um, how do you leverage. Uh, art expertise and curatorial um, knowledge uh, to create all of this. Uh, Dee Dee Wilsey, thank you so much thank for you. explaining to us some aspects of, uh, of these two museums, the De Young and the Legion, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you very much.